right, we are back. So last week we ended with poor Ralph um, being stuck in a trash can, thinking his life was going to be over. And fortunately, Keith found them and they, they kind of became friends. They're a little unsure of each other. Um, it's a little boy and a little mouse, but they seem to really be hitting it off, especially over the, that's right, the motorcycle. So at the very end of chapter four, we find out that Ralph gets to ride the motorcycle. He learns how to use it. And Keith is actually feeling kind of jealous. He's not jealous in a mean way, but he just wishes that he also could ride a motorcycle. So now we are on chapter five and the um, title is Adventure in the Night. See, each of these chapters has a clever little title that gives us a hint into what the chapter will be about. Adventure in the Night. When Ralph had mastered riding the motorcycle on the threadbare carpet, he went bumping over the roses on the less worn parts of under the dresser and the bedside table. That was fun too. Hey, whispered the boy, come on out where I can see you. Ooh. Ralph shot out into the moonlight where he stopped, sitting jauntily on the motorcycle with one foot resting on the floor. Say, he said, how about letting me take her out in the hall? You know, just for a little spin to see how fast she'll go. Promise you'll bring it back? Asked Keith. Scout's honor, answered Ralph, who had picked up many expressions from children who had stayed in 215. Okay, I'll tell you what, said Keith. You can use it at night and I'll use it in the daytime. I'll leave the door open an inch so you can get in. That way you can ride it up and down the hall at night. Can I really? This was more than Ralph had hoped for. Where do you want me to park it when I come in? He asked. Some place where the maid won't step on it, answered the boy. That's easy. Under the bed. She's practi she practically never cleans under the bed. Yes, I know, agreed Matt Keith. I looked. There are a lot of dust mice back there. Please, Ralph was pained. Oh, oh, sorry, said the boy. That's what my, mo my mother calls bunches of dusty fluff under the bed. My mother doesn't, said Ralph. Now, how about opening the door? The boy put his hand on the doorknob. You won't let anything happen to my motorcycle, will you? He asked. You know I wouldn't let anything happen to a beauty like this, said Ralph. Now pause here for a minute. This is a really good example of um, quotation marks and dialogue. So we've talked about that this year in, third, in second grade. Anytime you see a quotation mark like this, that's called a quotation mark. It means that somebody, one of the characters, is beginning to speak. It's, an, it's exactly word for word what they said. And then when you see the quotation mark in the opposite direction, it means they have stopped. And then it either, either tells you, you know, it says exclaimed Ralph or said Ralph or asked Ralph. And then if you don't see a quotation mark, that's just the narration. It's the narrator, the story. This part here, the boy put his hands on the doorknob. That's not a, there's no dialogue. There's no conversation there. So we're going to, this book has a lot of dialogue in it. And all dialogue means are two characters communicating or speaking to each other, um, or you can think of it as a conversation. And how we know is through quotation marks. Okay. You know I wouldn't let anything happen to a beauty like this, said Ralph. See that you don't, and don't stay out too late. The boy opened the door and permitted Ralph to putt out into the dim light of the hall. Ralph had a scary feeling he was on the threshold of adventure. There were no be beds or chairs for him to dart under in case of danger. The floor creaked. Someone was snoring in room 214 across the hall. Outside in the pines, an owl hooted, sending prickles up Ralph's spine. I'll go back and look at our picture. There's little Ralph in all the hotel rooms.
Ralph controlled the trembling of his paws while he hesitated outside the door to consider the possibility of the hall, which was carpeted down the center, leaving two smooth highways of bare floor on either side along the baseboards. It did not take Ralph long to decide what to do. He picked up his tail, took a deep breath, bent low over the handlebars, flattened his ears, and sped down the straightaway as fast as the motorcycle would go. He could feel his whiskers swept back by the force of his speed, it was glorious. Ralph had never ventured so far from, the, from home before. The old wooden hotel, cooling in the night air, snapped and creaked, but Ralph was brave. He was riding a motorcycle. He passed 213, ran out of breath, and let momentum carry him past another noisy snorer in room 211, on down the hall to the elevator, the mysterious elevator that carried people to that wonderful place Ralph had heard so much about, the ground floor. The ground floor is the floor that's level with the ground, the dirt. So Ralph is always on upstairs, he's in the second floor. When Ralph came to the stairs, he stopped to look down, knowing it was impossible to ride a motorcycle downstairs, and at the same time, wishing he could see him for himself the wonders that lay below. He sniffed the air, <laughs> And it seemed to him that he could smell the strange foods he had heard about. Cinnamon buns with sticky frosting, turkey stuffing and pancakes with maple syrup. A ray of moonlight from a window glinted on the glassy eye of a mounted deer's head over the chair landing and startled Ralph. Sending him off down the hall, past the broom closet and the linen room to the end of the hall where he executed a sharp turn and started back. Exhilarated by speed, Ralph raced up and down. Once he heard some people getting out of the elevator, he had to duck behind the curtain of the window at the end of the hall. Toward midnight, he passed his Aunt Sissy scurrying along the baseboard. He waved and nearly lost control of the motorcycle. Aunt Sissy stopped to stare while Ralph, Ralph rode on, feeling pleased with himself and at the same time sorry for Aunt Sissy. Poor frightened thing, with only her feet to carry her from one crumb to the next. Up and down the hall raced Ralph until, after an especially noisy outburst of speed outside room 211, he was startled to hear a dog bark inside the room. Now it was Ralph's turn to be frightened. Uh-oh, he thought. I'd better be careful. If there was one thing Ralph disliked, it was people who traveled with dogs. Dogs always sniffed around where they had no business sniffing. Once a dog had even barked into the mouse hole in room 215. It was days before Ralph's mother got over that. Ralph heard someone moving around inside room 211, and looking back over his shoulder, he saw the door open and a tussled man in a bathrobe and slippers appeared carrying a little terrier. The man looked cross and sleepy as he started down the hall toward the elevator with his dog. He was walking straight toward Ralph. <sighs> Realizing he was taking a chance, Ralph speeded up the motorcycle. If he turned and headed back to room 215, he would have to pass the man. It was better to continue toward the elevator and hope he could find a place to hide. He raced on down the hall. The wild barks of the little terrier, and you guys know a terrier is like a, a cute little, let me type in terrier real quick. A terrier is this kind of dog. There's lots of different kinds of terriers, but they kind of have some of the same features. The, the little, I don't know, kind of like they have little beards, but these are all terriers. Look at that. These are all terriers. There's a lot of different terriers. Woo! This one's so cute, I think. You know, I'm, I'm, this is called uh, Miss Bradbury's Getting Distracted. That's really cute. Y'all know Nina? That's, she's part rat terrier. Oh, they're so cute. Anyway, they're cute to us, but they're probably not very cute to our friend Ralph. Okay, the wild barks of the little terrier told Ralph that he had been seen by the dog, if not by the man. Uh-oh, looky here. That, what can we infer the feeling? What is the feeling of this dog right now? What is the feeling of the man? 
Be quiet, muttered the man to his dog. I'm going to walk you. You don't have to wake up the whole whole tell. Ralph reached the elevator where he drove around behind the ashtray on a stand beside the door. He stopped and waited, tense and frightened. Outside, an, owl, an owl hooted, was silent, and hooted again. A sudden breeze rattled windows and banged a door. Ralph's teeth began to chatter. The dog whimpered, <coughs> but the man walked straight past Ralph, pushed a button, and in a moment stepped into the elevator. Oh no, Ralph. Whew, thought Ralph when the elevator door had closed on the sleepy man and his noisy dog. Maybe he had better lie low for a while. In a few minutes, the elevator returned to the second floor. As the man stepped out, the little dog looked over his shoulder and spied Ralph parked behind the ashtray stand. Now remember, this, was, this book was written in 1967. This was written more than 50 years ago. In those times, people smoked actual like cigarettes or cigars they could smoke them inside of buildings and they could smoke them inside of a hotel so when you see ashtray and you might be wondering what are they talking about a long long time ago that was um that was acceptable because the dog was a captive and he was free ralph could not resist sticking out his tongue and waggling his paw in his ears a gesture he had learned from children in room 215 and one he knew was sure to arouse anger let me at him, barked the little terrier. Cut it out, grumbled the man, fumbling for the doorknob of room 211, while Ralph, a tear devil now, rode in a giddy circle around the ashtray stand. Giddy is like happy, you're laughing, you're feeling carefree. He had a feeling of cockiness he had never known before. Who said mice were timid? Ha! Cockiness is when you think you can do it all. You don't have a fear in the world. You don't care what anybody else says or thinks. You are just, you are basically, you are just full of confidence. It's not always a positive thing, though, to say somebody's cocky is not a positive thing. When the morning song of the birds in the pines grew louder than the snores of the guests and dawn slipped through the window at the end of the hall, Ralph knew it was time to return to room 215. There he was shocked to discover the door shut. Only then did he recall the draft in the night and the slam of the door. He got off the motorcycle and pounded on the door with his fist. But what sleeping boy could hear a mouse beating on a door? Ralph knew from experience that he could flatten himself out and crawl under the door of room 215. But there was no way he could get the motorcycle through the crack, not even by laying it on its side and pushing. The handlebars were too wide. Ralph dismounted from the motorcycle, sat down, and leaned back against the baseboard, prepared to guard the motorcycle, until Keith awoke and discovered the door blown shut. He was tired after a night of such great excitement and full of dreams. Now that he had seen the hall, he could no longer be satisfied with room 215. It was not enough. He longed to see the rest of the world, the dining room and the kitchen and the storeroom and the garbage cans out back. He wanted to see the game room where he had been told grown-up people played games with cards and balls and paddles. He wanted to go outdoors and brave the owls to hunt for seeds. Ralph, a growing mouse who needed his rest, dozed off against the baseboard beside the motorcycle. Now stop, everybody stop. Does anyone have a prediction about what might happen if Ralph is falling asleep? You can share it in your mind or share it with somebody next to you. I predict that. After the experiences of this night, he would never be the same mouse again. The next thing Ralph knew, Matt, the bellboy, was standing over him. Aren't you out pretty late? Matt asked, causing Ralph to jump to his feet, even though he was, he was not entirely awake. You should have been in bed long ago, but I suppose you were out till all hours speeding around on that motorcycle. Ralph had seen Matt many times but this was the first time the old man had spoken to him. He was astonished to discover 
they spoke the same language. Even so, Ralph stood in front of the motorcycle. Anyone who tried to take it away from him would have to fight Ralph first. Nice little machine you got there, remarked Matt. Kinda wish I was young enough to ride in one myself. Must be fun, speeding along, making all that noise. Ralph realized that Matt was a friend. Say, he began, how about helping a fellow out? Sure, agreed Matt. What can I do you for? Or what can I do for you? What's your prediction? What's he going to ask Matt? Open that door a crack, just enough so I can ride through. I promised the boy I would park his motorcycle under the bed. Good place, said the mat. The maid never cleans there if she can help it. Very quietly, he turned the doorknob, the knob, and opened the door just enough to, for Ralph to ride through. Ralph bumped up over the edge of the carpet, swung out around the wastebasket, and the bedside table and was about to drive under the table when Eek! screamed the boy's mother who was standing in the doorway between 215 and 216 in her bathrobe with her hair up and rollers. A mouse! Ralph put on a burst of speed and shot under the bed. Wh where? asked the boy's father coming in from 216. Under the bed. Uh, oh look mom said the boy, jumping out of bed. Uh-oh, here's the mom. We can just imagine how she feels. <laughs> Poor Ralph on his motorcycle, he's so cute. Keith's face appeared under the lifted edge of the bedspread, where Ralph sat trembling on the motorcycle. The boy held out his hand and beckoned. Ralph understood. He dismounted and ran up the boy's arm inside the sleeve of his pajamas until he came to the crook of his elbow. There he waited, shivering, to see what would happen next. Down at the end of the sleeve, he could see the boy's fingers close around the motorcycle. Then he felt himself being lifted as the boy rose from his hands and knees. It's just my motorcycle, Keith said. Yes, that's it agreed his mother. The door opened and the mouse rode in. The boy's father began to laugh. You are still dreaming. But, but I'm positive, insisted the boy's mother, that you saw a mouse on a little red motorcycle, finished the boy's father and laughed even harder. You make it sound so ridiculous, objected the mother. Well, the father snorted with laughter. Well, perhaps I was dreaming admitted the mother reluctantly. But I know I saw a mouse. I'm positive, and I'm going to report it to the management. I knew the minute we moved into this spooky old place that it had mice. Now I've done it, thought Ralph inside the pajama sleeve. Hmm, so who came to the rescue? On to chapter six peanut butter sandwich. I told you to be careful, scolded Keith, when his parents had gone to dress and Ralph had crawled down his arm into his hand. It wasn't my fault the door blew shut. Ralph jumped from the ha hand to the bedspread. Though Keith was a friendly boy, even a generous one, Ralph still did not like the feel of skin against his paws. It must be terrible to go through life without fur and such a nuisance having to wear clothes that had to be washed and drip dried. Ralph knew all about drip drying. Many were the drops of water from shirts and slips that he had dodged going in and out of his mouse hole. You didn't have to stay out so long, Keith pointed out as he began to dress. What's the use of having a motorcycle if you can't go tearing around staying out late? Ralph asked reasonably. You don't have a motorcycle, said Keith. I just let you use mine. And you better be careful. I like that motorcycle, and I don't want anything to happen to it. I'll take care of it, promised Ralph, somewhat chastened. I don't want anything to happen to it either. 
It's going to be harder to get a chance to write it now that my mother has seen you, said Keith. She is a terribly good, she's a terribly good housekeeper, and she sure to, she's sure to complain to the management. Speaking of breakfast, <clears throat> you people are too tidy, complained Ralph. I'm not getting enough to eat around here. You don't leave enough crumbs. I never thought of it, said Keith. What would you like to eat? Ralph was astounded. Astounded means shocked, surprised. This was the first time in his life anyone had asked him what he would like to eat. It had been always been a question of what he could get his paws on. You mean I have a choice? He asked, incredulous. Incredulous? That word also is just like unbelievable. And you don't, when you almost doubt it, in this case, it's so good to be true, he doubts it. Sure, said the boy. All I have to do is order it when you go down to breakfast and then they bring it, they bring you some. Ralph had to take time to think. After a diet of zweeback and graham crackers provided by little children, bits of candy, and an occasional peanut or apple core left by medium-sized children, or a crust of toast and a dab of jam left by an adult who had ordered breakfast sent up from room service, the possibilities of choosing his own meal were almost too much. Let me go back up real quick. I do not know what zweeback is. I'm going to type that in, zweeback. Oh, look at this. It's a rusk or cracker made by a small, baking a small loaf and then toasting slices until they're dry and crisp. Hmm. It's from like Germany, Scandinavia, Austria. Well, boys and girls, I just learned Zwieback. It's kind of like, I think like Melba toast, maybe. Okay. Here we go. I know what I'd like, Ralph said at last, but I don't know what you call it. Once some people who said they were almost out of money stayed in these rooms. They had four children, all of them hungry, and they couldn't afford to go to the dining room. So they got some bread and spread it with some brown, something brown out of a jar and put some more bread on top of that. They whispered all the time they were eating because they didn't want the maid or bellboy to know they were having a meal in their room. Afterwards, they all got it down on their hands and knees and picked up every single crumb on the carpet so no one would guess they had eaten in their rooms. It was a great disappointment. It smelled so good. Like peanuts, only better. The boy laughed. It was a peanut butter sandwich. Sure, I'll bring you a peanut butter sandwich. Or part of one. I'll eat part of it myself. It'll be kind of a funny breakfast, but I won't mind that. Where will you leave it? asked Ralph. He thought a minute. Where do you live? he asked. In the knot hole under the window. No kidding, Ralph laughed. That's the hole I poked my finger in last night. I'll say you did, said Ralph. Scared me out of a year's growth. Nobody has ever guessed it's a mouth hole because it's not a knot, a mouse hole because it's not a knot hole instead of a chewed hole. I'll tell you what, said Keith. I'll bring a part of a peanut butter sandwich and poke it through the knot hole. Just like room service. Ralph could not have been more pleased with the suggestion. Uh, what about the motorcycle? He asked. Where are you going to leave that? In my suitcase, I guess. Oh, come on, pleaded Ralph. Have a heart. Leave it someplace where I can get it while you're out during the day. You're supposed to be in your mouse hole asleep not riding around in the daylight where people can see you. Well, gee whiz, can't a fellow even look at it? Asked Ralph. I bet you like to look at big motorcycles yourself. Yes, I do, admitted the boy. Well, I'll leave it back under the bed, like I said, but you promise not to ride it until after dark. Scout's honor. Ralph jumped off the bed and ran off to the knot hole. Ralph's home was furnished with a clutter of things people drop on the floor of a hotel room. Bits of Kleenex, hair, ravelings. His mother was always planning to straighten it out, but she never got around to it. She was always too busy fussing and worrying. Now, as Ralph expected, she was dividing rice cri rye crisp crumbs among his squeaky bunch of little brothers and sisters while she waited to scold him. Ralph, 
if I have told you once, I have told you a thousand times, she began. Guess what? interrupted Ralph in an attempt to change, to change the subject. Somebody in 215 is going to bring us a real peanut butter sandwich. Ralph, cried his frightened mother. You haven't been associating with people. Nah, he's just a boy, said Ralph, deciding to keep the complete story of the dangers and the glories of the past night to himself. He wouldn't hurt us. He likes mice. But he's a person, said his mother. You can see the mommy here and her children. That doesn't mean he has to be bad, said Ralph. Just like Pop used to say, people shouldn't all shouldn't say all mice are timid just because some mice are, or that all mice play when the cat's away just because some do. Just the same, Ralph, said his mother. I do wish you would be more careful with whom you associate with. I am so afraid you'll fall in with the wrong sort of friends. I'm growing up, said Ralph. I'm getting too old to hang around a mouse nest all the time. I want to go out and see the world. I want to go down on the ground floor and see the kitchen and the dining room and the storeroom and the garbage cans out back. Oh, Ralph, cried his mother. Not the ground floor, not all the way down there. You aren't old enough. Yes, I am, said Ralph stoutly. There's no telling what you might run into down there. Mouse traps, cats, poison. Why, I'll buy the garbage cans. You might even be seen by an owl. I don't care, said Ralph. Someday, I'm going downstairs. But think of the owls, Ralph, implored his mother. We moved into the hotel because of the owls. It was after your uncle Leroy disappeared and his bones were found in an owl pellet. The mother's mouse's plea was interrupted by the sound of Keith returning to room 215. Now you'll see, said Ralph to his mother, and waited anxious, lest his friend let him down. Sure enough, Keith came back, came to the knothole. He whispered. Here it is. The waitress thought I was crazy ordering a peanut butter sandwich along with my cornflakes for breakfast, but here it is. He stuffed half a sandwich a bit at a time into the hole where Ralph seized the pieces and pulled them all the way through. Listen, we're going to be gone most of the day. The dining room is is packing us a picnic lunch, and we're going to drive along some of the back roads and visit some old mining towns. Thanks a lot, Ralph managed to say with his mouth watering. Have fun! See you tonight, said Keith. Have a good day's sleep. Ralph's mother could not help being impressed by the sight of that peanut butter sandwich. Just like room service, she marveled. Why, it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and it even has butter in it. I told you he would bring it. Ralph could not help boasting, even though his mouth was full. Boasting, we learned this word, I think, from uh, Charlotte's Web. That's when you're bragging about something. But he's not boasting in a mean way. Just kind of like, mm-hmm, told you so. After sharing his feast with his squeaky little brothers and sisters, all of whom had trouble with peanut butter sticking to their teeth, Ralph curled up on a heap of shredded Kleenex and took a good long nap. When he awoke refreshed, his first thought was of the motorcycle. He wondered if Keith really had remembered to leave it under the bed. He yawned and stretched and left by way of the knot hole. Room 215 was just as Ralph had last seen it. The bed had not been made and there were no fresh towels by the wash basin. Ralph ducked under the sheets and blankets that had tumbled off one side of the bed, and there in the dim light, he caught the gleam of the chromium exhaust pipes. Keith had trusted him after all. He walked across the carpet and took hold of the hand grips once more. They felt just right in his paws, and he longed to be off, speeding around the threadbare spots on the carpet. But a promise was a promise. Keith had kept his promise about the peanut butter sandwich. Ralph would keep his about not riding the motorcycle in the daytime. He tried to satisfy himself by walking around the motorcycle in the dim light under the bed, 
admiring all over again the sleek design of the machine. Ralph was lost in admiration and daydreams of speed and power when suddenly the door opened and the maid entered. It was too late to make a dash for the mouse hole. The maid stripped the blankets and sheets from the bed, shedding unwelcome light on Ralph and the motorcycle. Her feet and white sneakers moved lightly as she gathered up the sheets and pillowcases and towels and dropped them with a soft plop beside the open door. The next thing Ralph knew, he was hearing familiar and dreaded footsteps coming down the hall, steps he had learned to fear when he was a tiny mouse. It was the head housekeeper, the woman who was in charge of all the maids in the hotel. He recognized her steps and he recognized her shoes, stout, sensible black Oxfords. Nothing was ever clean enough for the head housekeeper, and Ralph's whole family lived in dread lest she discover their mouse hole. Now he held his breath, <gasps> hoping she would go on down the hall, but no, she stepped into room 215. Wonder why? Does anybody think they know why she might be visiting? Why she's paying this room in particular a visit? Good morning, Marjorie. The housekeeper spoke crisply to the maid. Be sure you clean 215 and 216 very thoroughly this morning. There has been a complaint from the guests. They suspect mice. Yes, ma'am, said the maid. Look behind all the drawers, continued the housekeeper, and in the corners of the closet. Please report any evidence of mice, and be sure you vacuum under the beds. You have been getting careless lately. With that, she walked briskly down the hall. Oh, grouch, muttered the maid as she reached into the hall for something that produced a sound that struck terror into Ralph's heart. It was the clang of vacuum cleaner attachments banging together. Why would Ralph hate a vacuum cleaner? All right, we will find out on Wednesday.